As mentioned in a previous chapter, stars and planets have often been seen through the moon, which means it is semi-transparent, and if the moon is semi-transparent, it cannot be the solid, spherical planetoid claimed by modern astronomy. Samuel Shenton, president of the Flat Earth Society, was quoted before the Apollo supposed moon landings, stating that stars have been seen through the moon. The astronauts had better be ready to come right back because there isn't anything much to land on. Samuel Shenton also said, We so-called flat earthers, observing certain false presentation used by the Americans in TV and films showing the orbits and descents of their space vehicles, wish to place our views before young and interested people. In so doing, we trust that no more jibes about flat earthers will be occasioned from Prime Minister Wilson of the Socialist Party and Enoch Powell of the Conservative Party. Many of the first people to unequivocally call out the NASA moon landings as being a staged hoax, besides knowledgeable flat earthers, were professional photographers. When the official NASA photographs of the moon are closely examined, it is clear that many were taken inside a studio using repetitive backgrounds, artificial lighting, wires, and cranes. Others were composite desert photographs with the backgrounds blacked out and astronauts superimposed in. Award-winning British photographer David Percy, photo analyst and historian Jack White, photographer for Nexus Magazine publisher Marcus Allen, and many others have put their professional reputations on the line to expose NASA's photographic evidence. David Percy from Dark Moon, Apollo, and the Whistleblowers says, the numerous inconsistencies clearly visible in the Apollo photographic record is quite irrefutable. Some of the many errors we evidence were due to haste and poor thinking. Others were deliberately planted by individuals we have dubbed whistleblowers, who were determined to leave evidence of the faking in which they were unwillingly involved. Probably the most emphatic of these whistles was a bottle that rolled across the moon landscape on the TV screens in Western Australia during a live transmission from the moon. None of the Apollo missions brought any extra studio lighting with them on the lunar lander, so the sun should be the only light source on the moon, and in all pictures taken there. In that case, the light should only come from one direction, and all shadows should be cast in the opposite direction. However, in dozens of official NASA photos, there are shadows being cast in up to three directions simultaneously, often at up to 90 degree angles, which can only be the result of multiple light sources not present on the moon. Several pictures even show overhead spotlights reflecting an astronaut's helmets and multiple lens flares originating from two or more light sources. Analyzing several images from the six missions shows repeated background features the exact same hills, dunes, craters being used over and over again in supposedly different places on the moon, as well as visible foreground and backdrop lines indicative of a studio set. In images from Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin can be seen wearing different color gloves and different length boots in pictures that were supposedly taken within minutes of each other. If Buzz was really in the vacuum of space in a pressurized spacesuit, he certainly would not have had time or reason to depressurize and repressurize his suit just to make such fashion adjustments. Some pictures show the lunar rover with no tracks anywhere around it. Others show rover tracks all over the foreground while it is yet to be unpacked and unloaded. A couple pictures even show what appear to be sneakers and ladies' heels tracks on the moon in addition to astronauts' boot prints. Ralph Fernay from NASA Mooned America says, If you look at the backgrounds of most NASA pictures, there is a relatively sharp transition line where anything beyond becomes smooth and featureless. This is a sure sign of a grade Z studio backdrop. Every time the American flag is shown, there is a great deal of light on it, even if it's in the shadow side of the lunar lander. Also, NASA never filmed either stars or planets. The reason is simple. Before the era of computer enhancement, the stars would have been impossible to fake accurately enough to fool the world's amateur astronomers. Sam Colby in Apollo Fake says, Michael J. Tuttle faked the so-called Apollo training simulation photographs using Photoshop 3 and then posted them on NASA websites as being genuine photographs taken on the moon. 
I regularly get email from people claiming that digital manipulation of photographs was not available back in 1969. People have been creating fake photographs ever since the camera was invented, and who is saying the pictures were faked back in 1969 anyway? People don't understand that the majority of NASA's fake moon pictures were created in the mid-90s. The proof lies in the fact that most do not appear in any books or magazines prior to 1990. 95% of NASA's fake moon pictures on their websites were never seen prior to the launch of the internet. They had to produce a considerable number of fake moon pictures for all six missions, otherwise the public would want to know why there were so few. Not all of NASA's fake Apollo pictures have been altered with Photoshop. The main Apollo 11 picture of Buzz Aldrin, as well as press-released pictures from Apollo 12 and Apollo 14 showing astronauts holding the flag, all of these press release pictures were taken in the fake moonscape at Langley Research Center and did not require any alteration to pass off as a moon photograph. Another glaring mistake is that none of NASA's images or videos show stars in the background as they should, just complete blackness, likely because exact star maps as they should appear from the moon would be quite difficult to fake. The testimony of different astronauts on different missions in their autobiographies and interviews just muddies the waters even more, some of them bragging about the astonishingly brilliant light of the stars, and others saying they don't remember seeing a single star while on the moon. Such inconsistencies and the fact that none of NASA's moon pictures feature stars or planets in their appropriate positions should raise a red flag that these astronauts were not on the moon. Many pictures of the sun on the moon are clearly spotlights and not the sun, including AS-1466-9306, AS-1246-6765, and AS-1140-5935. NASA image AS-1249-7278 clearly shows several studio lighting lens flares caused by multiple overhead lights. Image AS 1469989 shows studio lighting reflecting off a black background. Image AS 17151-23201 shows a shadow on the ceiling of the space as the lunar lander lifts off. Images AS 16118-18894 AS 17134-20471 AS 1144-6581 and AS 1144-6642 show crude computer retouching to hide cables and background problems and add the round earth, but NASA claims they are original photographs. AS 1466-9306 shows shadows of reticule crosshairs suspended in air over a print underneath proving it to be doctored and not an original, as claimed. Image AS 1140-5922 of the lunar lander supposedly on the moon shows a pathetic 1969 attempt at creating high-tech looking equipment using what appears to be construction paper, gold foil, scotch tape, and metal shower rods. The idea that the piece of junk shown in this official NASA photograph flew to the moon and back is so ludicrous it's laughable. AS 17148-22756 also clearly shows, when enlarged, that the Apollo 17 command module was almost completely held together by scotch tape. In AS 16113-18339, there is a rock with the letter C clearly engraved into it, as well as another C drawn into the dirt next to it. This is characteristic of fake stage rocks on a stage setup where the set designer demarcates prop positions and not something we should see on the moon. Ralph Fernay in NASA Moon America says, The large rock in the left foreground is clearly marked with a big capital C. The bottom right corner has a crease similar to that caused by wetting a folded newspaper. This makes it a showbiz flap rock which the people who work in Hollywood studios throw at visitors. They used to be made from wet newspaper and paste and showed similar flaps. Stage rocks are usually placed by stagehands over similarly lettered markers positioned by the set designer. Did NASA really carry fake boulders and stagehands onto the moon? 
NASA image AS114526 shows a close-up of the foot pads of the lunar lander without a speck of dust on them and without a burn print under its 10,000 pound thrusters like it was just gently set down in place. NASA scientists in their own documents were worried about the LEM falling into its own massive burn radius, yet there it sits with no burn print and spotless clean pads. Even the astronauts' boot prints made deep impressions in the moon dust, yet the lander's 10,000-pound thrusters left not a trace, no blast hole, and no dust on the pads. Eugene Cernan of Apollo 10 and 17 said in an interview that as they descended in the lander that the engine was very loud, yet when Alan Bean of Apollo 12 was asked the same question, he answered that you couldn't hear the engine at all in the vacuum of space. I tend to believe Alan, because watching the Apollo 17 liftoff sequence from the moon, it is clear that the LEM is being hoisted by a crane from above and not propelled by thrusters from below. Ralph Rene says, I remember watching the first astronauts land on the moon and wondering why the TV pictures were so murky. We watched two blurry white ghosts who did little or nothing while they lurked in the shadow of the lunar lander. NASA seemed to have lost a hundred years of photographic progress. It was boring, but I believed. During the next few years, I caught glimpses of subsequent missions as they flashed in color upon my TV screen, and I believed. Pictures improved with each mission, and toward the end, the Apollo program, the moon buggy tore up the moon's surface while NASA began to talk up a Martian adventure. I still believed in apple pie, the CIA, and NASA. Years later, watching a TV show, I thought I saw the moon flag ripple on the airless moon. The worm of suspicion slid into my system. I then began watching NASA film clips very closely and with less emotion. As those rose-colored glasses slipped lower on my nose, I began to notice flaws in the pictures. The astronauts and their backpacks weighed less than 75 pounds on the moon, yet they left deep footprints in the moon dust and gravel. The blast of a rocket engine that lowered the 33,000-pound lem on the moon's surface left no crater, and apparently it didn't even blow away the dust beneath the footpads. Strange. Here on Earth, footprints usually require some type of wetting agent. There is no wet on the moon. When the video evidence is examined, even more anomalies are found. In certain frames, light pings can be seen reflecting off overhead stage wires attached to astronauts' backpacks. In one Apollo 16 clip, an astronaut falls to his knees and is quickly jerked back up to his feet by what can only be an unseen wire hoisting him straight upwards. One of the more obvious video anomalies is how several Apollo missions show American flags flapping around in the not-existent space wind. The moon is supposed to have no atmosphere, and so the flags should remain perfectly still, but can often be seen moving about quite boisterously. NASA claims the astronauts brushing up against them could cause this, but it, it's clearly not the case as the flags stay waving for long periods of time with no astronauts touching or even near them. Another interesting video anomaly is discovered by playing NASA's moon footage at two times speed then watching the astronauts walking, running, jumping, or cruising around on their little buggy. Without the speed adjustment, there is a low-gravity type illusion as the astronauts seem to float, drift, and glide slowly and smoothly along. But once they are seen at two times speed, it becomes clear that they are in normal gravity, walking, running, jumping, and cruising at normal speeds. They simply reduce the play speed by 50% in post-production, and voila! instant moon motion. William Cooper said, Most, if not all, of the photos, films, and videotape of the Apollo moon missions are easily proven to be fake. Anyone with the slightest knowledge of photography, lighting, and physics can easily prove that NASA faked the visual records of the Apollo space program. They are so obviously fake that when the discrepancies are pointed out to unsuspecting viewers, an audible gasp has been heard. Some have actually gone into a mild state of shock. Some people break down and cry. I've even seen others become so angry that they have ripped the offending photos to shreds while screaming incoherently. 
Not only is the video record fraught with fraud, but NASA claims the original Apollo 11 videos have conveniently disappeared from their records, so no one can analyze them for authenticity. That's right. They spent over $30 billion of American taxpayer money traveling to the moon and then lost the video evidence. Those blurry, ghostly, black and white images shown on TV were purposely lousy because NASA insisted at the time that all TV networks must broadcast directly from a big screen display in their operations room, a mandate which all the major networks accepted, and so what the public saw was just a video of a poorly magnified video, and now it is impossible to watch the original. Not only has the Apollo 11 original disappeared, but NASA claims to have lost all original audio tapes from the Apollo missions, and that their contractors have lost all prints and plans for the lunar rover, LEM lander, and Apollo ship engines. What are the chances that these are actually lost? And what are the chances that NASA simply cannot have the public scrutinizing their records because of what might be exposed? William Cooper said, Exploration of the moon stopped because it was impossible to continue the hoax without being ultimately discovered, and of course they ran out of pre-filmed episodes. No man has ever ascended higher than 300 miles, if that high, above the Earth's surface. No man has ever orbited, landed on, or walked upon the moon in any publicly known space program. If you doubt this, please explain how the astronauts walked upon the moon's surface enclosed in a spacesuit in full sunlight, absorbing a minimum of 265 degrees of heat surrounded by a vacuum. Temperatures on the moon supposedly range from 279 degrees below zero during the depths of the lunar night, which is far colder than even Antarctica's coldest winter, and up to 243 degrees above zero at lunar midday, which is hotter than boiling water. NASA claims their special suits are fitted with both heating and cooling systems, but nothing which could withstand these incredible temperatures. These suits are also supposedly pressurized to keep the vacuum non-pressure of space from bursting their blood vessels, but they clearly have deep creases and wrinkles all over. Astronauts in true pressurized suits would look like the Michelin Man bubbling out. Also, the amount of radiation in space, especially through the Van Allen belt, is far too intense for them to be spacewalking in such flimsy suits. One Russian study found that the amount of radiation present on the moon would require astronauts to be clothed in four feet of lead in order to avoid instant death. John Malden, a NASA physicist, said they would need at least two meters of thick shielding around them at all times, yet there they are, bouncing around the moon in their two-inch thin suits. Another solid proof of NASA living up to its forked serpent tongue logo are the many supposed moon rocks given to museums the world over by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Shortly after Apollo 11, private investigator Paul Jacobs reported asking the U.S. Department of Geology head whether he had examined the moon rocks and if he could verify their authenticity to which the geologist simply laughed and insinuated that people high in the U.S. government knew all about the cover-up. More recently, in 2009, curators at Amsterdam's Rijksmuseum investigated their moon rock, personally given to them by Armstrong and Aldrin in 1969, only to find that it was actually a worthless piece of petrified wood. Bill Casing, another moon hoax researcher, worked at Rocketdyne, where NASA Saturn V rocket engines were built and became exposed to documents pertaining to the Mercury, Gemini, Atlas, and Apollo NASA programs, which proved trickery was afoot. Casing said of the documents that one does not need an engineering or science degree to determine that a hoax was being perpetrated. He wrote a book about his findings called We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 Billion Swindle. In it, he exposes how NASA staged both the Apollo 1 fire and Challenger accident, deliberately murdering the astronauts on board to silence them. Before the first Apollo mission ever even cleared the launch pad, 11 NASA astronauts died in highly suspicious accidents. Gus Grisham, Roger Chafee, and Ed White were all cremated together in an Apollo capsule fire during a completely unnecessary and dangerous test where they were strapped down and locked into a 100%
oxygen chamber, which incinerated the three of them to death in seconds. Seven other astronauts, Ted Freeman, Charles Bassett, Elliot C., Russell Rogers, Clifton Williams, Michael Adams, and Robert Lawrence died in six separate airplane crashes, and Ed Givens in a car crash. Eight of these deaths were in 1967 alone. So many astronauts coincidentally dying under such circumstances is highly unlikely and lends credence to the idea that these were intentional hits by the Masons trying to find the right people to sell their hoax. One of the most outspoken of the fallen astronauts was Gus Grissom. By 1967, Grissom had become increasingly irritated and vocally negative about NASA's chances of ever landing on the moon. He stated the odds were pretty slim and famously hung a lemon on the Apollo capsule after it repeatedly failed safety testing procedures. Grissom threatened to go public with his complaints about the LEM and even told his wife Betty, if there ever is a serious accident in the space program, it's likely to be me. Right after his murder, government agents raided Grissom's house before anyone had been informed about the fire or his death. They removed all his personal papers and his diary, never to be returned. Ralph Rene writes, In a prosecutorial mode, I accuse NASA, the CIA, and whatever super-secret group that controls the shadow government of these United States of fraud on the grandest scale imaginable, of murder by arson, and of larceny of over $40 billion in conjunction with the Apollo program that allegedly landed men on the moon. I also accuse them of violating a federal law against lobbying by government-funded entities and of serial murder of low-level NASA employees, witnesses, and other citizens who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Such accusations seem incredible because none of us ever want to believe our governmental father is deceiving us. However, by the end of this book, even the most trusting reader will have no doubt that NASA mooned America. In 2001, investigative journalist and award-winning filmmaker Bart Sabrell produced the excellent documentary A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. When requesting footage for his movie, Sabrell was sent, either by mistake or by a well-meaning whistleblower, an official raw-slated NASA clip from the Apollo 11 mission showing a young Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins for almost an hour using transparencies and camera tricks to fake shots of a round Earth. They communicate over audio with Control in Houston about how to accurately stage the shot, and someone keeps prompting them on how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired effect. First, they blacked out all the windows, except for a downward-facing circular one, which they aimed the camera towards from several feet away. This created the illusion of a ball-shaped earth surrounded by the blackness of space, when in fact it was simply a round window in their dark cabin. Neil Armstrong, claimed at this point to be 130,000 miles from Earth, halfway to the moon. But when camera tricks were finished, the viewer could see for themselves the astronauts were not more than 100 miles above the Earth's surface, likely flying in a high-altitude plane. Film interviews with Apollo astronauts and ask them to swear on the Bible that they walked on the moon. In reaction to Sabrell's accusations, many of the astronauts indeed went wild. John Young of Apollo 10 and 16 threatened to knock him in the head, then ran away into a nearby closing elevator. Ed Mitchell of Apollo 14 literally kicked him out the door and threatened to shoot him. Buzz Aldrin punched him square in the face. The documentary is a fascinating psychological study, watching the astronauts repeatedly squirm and quickly escalate to threats and violence. They behave more like pathological liars than honorable cosmonauts. Many of them have battled depression and alcoholism since returning from the moon as well. Buzz Aldrin was once asked at a NASA banquet what it felt like to first step onto the lunar surface. He staggered to his feet speechless, then left crying uncontrollably. On the 25th anniversary event for the Apollo 11 landing, one of the few interview appearances Armstrong ever made, he gave a cryptic speech basically telling the young people in attendance that there were many truths about Apollo that they could uncover if they dug deep enough. He said, holding tears back, Today we have with us a group of young students, America's best. 
To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. In the past 45 years, the Masons in Hollywood and NASA have only gotten more adept at Photoshop, CGI, and faking shots of Earth from space. Hit movies like Apollo 13 and Gravity show how realistic and convincing these soundstage, green screen, computer built environments can be. People believe it more, too. A night's newspaper survey taken just after the Apollo landings found 30% of Americans were suspicious of NASA's trip to the moon. A Gallup poll taken in 1999 found only 6% of Americans had any doubt about the Apollo astronauts walking on the moon. Ralph Rene says, NASA is now preparing to take us to Mars, the same way they took us to the moon. This time, a small cadre of computer experts will astound us with photos created by the new digitized computer graphics which didn't exist in 1969. Next time, we will have no way of determining the truth. Since the faked Apollo moon landings in 1969, NASA has moved on to faking Mars landings with the 1976 Viking, 1997 Pathfinder, and 2007 Phoenix. Right after landing, they got straight to work photoshopping the famous Face on Mars, Martian Pyramids, and the supposed Martian city of Sidonia. NASA shills like Richard Hoagland and Stephen Greer have ever since been propagating the idea that this and other evidence proves the existence of extraterrestrial aliens. Just like the faked moon landings, however, their science fiction Mars landings are utter bold-faced lies. To begin with, the planets, formerly known as wandering stars, are not terrestrial Earth-like habitations capable of landing anything on. The sun, moon, and stars are all simply luminaries, celestial lights, relatively close to Earth, not something tangible and solid that humans could ever walk on. Gabrielle Henriette in Heaven and Earth says, The planets are not solid, opaque masses of matter, as is believed. They are simply immaterial, luminous, and transparent disks. Even assuming Mars was an actual spherical desert planet, as NASA claims, it is impossible for them to have safely landed the probes based on their own trials and statistics. They say the surface pressure on Mars is only three-tenths of one percent the surface pressure on Earth, an equivalent to the pressure at about 23 miles above Earth. There is not enough air matter at that pressure, however, to provide any lift for opening and billowing out the parachutes NASA uses to land its Mars probes. No parachute ever devised has been able to successfully deploy at that altitude. They simply stream straight back, then never fill the rest of the way down. Joe Kittinger's record highest, fastest, and longest parachute dive from the Earth's upper atmosphere had him free-falling from only 19 miles high for 15 minutes at 767 miles per hour, and his drogue chute proved useless and offered no deceleration. Yet NASA would have us believe, for example, that Phoenix's parachute managed to somehow slow it down from 12,738 miles per hour to 123 miles per hour in just 2.86 minutes before its final landing. In other words, NASA is claiming to do something on Mars that we have no evidence is even possible on Earth at significantly lower altitude and 16 times slower speed. Ralph Rene says, on July 14th, 1976, the orbiter module, which weighed 5,125 pounds, detached its lander. I can find no listed weight in my encyclopedia on space, but since it could carry up to 638 pounds of fuel in addition to its payload, that lander had to weigh at least 1,000 pounds. NASA claims that after the lander was detached, rockets were used to slow it down to 560 miles per hour at an altitude of 800,000 feet. Then it was allowed to fall 781,000 feet under Martian gravity before a parachute was deployed at 19,000 feet. At 4,600 feet, this chute was detached and NASA tells us that it then had a velocity of 145 miles per hour. Rocket engines under computer control then landed it. Martian gravity, about 0.37 that of Earth gravity, accelerates an object at 32 feet per second. 
This gives Mars the ability to accelerate an object at 11.84 feet per second. The 560 miles an hour horizontal motion will not affect the downward velocity of an object that falls 781,000 feet on Mars. The terminal velocity at the time the chute was deployed was about 4,300 feet per second, which is almost 3,000 miles per hour. That's much faster than a speeding bullet. NASA claims that in a matter of 14,400 feet, that chute, operating under near-vacuum conditions, reduced the lander's speed to 145 miles per hour. Sure it did. That was then. Let's look at now. The next probe to land on Mars did so on July 4, 1997. NASA tells us that the Pathfinder came in at 16,600 miles per hour and was then jettisoned to boldly plunge into the fringes of the Martian atmosphere without using retro rockets to enter orbit. As usual, there were two different histories given by NASA. The first states that, by some miracle during the next minute, its speed was reduced to 1,000 miles per hour. The second states that it was jettisoned at 5,300 miles and its speed was reduced in 30 minutes while it fell to 80 miles. In the first case, the deceleration would have been incredible. However, in the second case, the Pathfinder would be at the 80-mile high place, still doing 4,280 miles per hour. The NASA story gets murky, but it is assumed the Pathfinder was again allowed to freefall until it was 7 miles high when NASA claims the parachute opened. Instead of streaming because it had been popped in almost a vacuum, it billowed forth and slowed the Pathfinder down. When it was one mile up, it dropped the chute, blew up the airbag, and fired retro rockets, reducing its speed to 23 miles per hour. Then the airbag hit the ground and bounced either three times or 16 times, depending on which official NASA story you believe. MX News on June 3, 2008, featured a picture given to them by NASA of the Phoenix's first dig into Martian soil. But on June 6, 2008, three days later, the London Daily Telegraph reported from NASA that another communications glitch stopped NASA's Phoenix lander from making its first dig into Martian soil. How could they give the photo to MX News if they had yet to make their first dig? And why can they never keep their story straight? Then, Mars Phoenix Lander's robotic arm photographed image 89666-2759, taken at 1439-37 LST, and image 89666-2868 at 1441-23 LST, only 2 minutes and 46 seconds later. In the first image, there is a fallen, loose screw visible by the leg, which disappears before the second photo is taken. NASA themselves claim the robot arm did not touch Martian soil until the next day, so they cannot claim to have moved it themselves, and the topical arrangement of sand and rocks remains exactly the same, so it cannot be explained by strong winds. Thus the question remains, who picked up the screw? More than likely, an observant and well-meaning stagehand picked it up between shots. Jera White, a diligent Mars hoax researcher, also noticed that the Columbia commemorative plaque attached to the Spirit rover on Mars photos and videos is not the same one pictured on Earth seconds before launch. This is blatant proof that photo trickery is going on with these Mars missions. Several photography experts have even mentioned how Mars looks exactly like Arizona or parts of the Australian outback desert, and it appears NASA simply added a red tint to the atmosphere in post-production. By using the Auto Levels tool in Photoshop, even NASA Mars photographs lose their red tint, however, and look exactly like the Earth. Adolf Hitler says, and they would not believe that others could have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously. Even though the facts which prove this to be so may be brought clearly to their minds, they will still doubt and waver and will continue to think that there may be some other explanation. For the grossly impudent lie always leaves traces behind it, even after it has been nailed down, a fact which is known to all expert liars in this world and to all who conspire together in the art of lying. And Ralph Rene says, Since 1973... Over one billion children all over the world have grown into adults. They've been taught to believe in the fairy tale that we landed men on the moon. 
I hope this book will one day banish forever this fanciful tale and relegate the story of NASA's moon and Mars landings to the realm of fraud where they belong. So there you go. You still think NASA went to the moon? If you still believe that, you're ridiculous. Okay? You're just ridiculous. If you sat through this whole thing, you watched the video evidence, you saw all the pictures, you heard all the proof, fake moon rocks, faces and pyramids on Mars, the astronauts punching people, 11 accidental astronaut deaths, all the photo anomalies. You still gonna read the NASA press release next week about, we found water on Mars. Derp. You gonna believe that? What about the Rosetta Comet landing? We landed on a asteroid. Here's some CGI. And everyone believes it. Oh, it's so amazing. Oh my god, they landed on an asteroid. Are you starting to realize how gullible we've all been here? Look at the videos and pictures they show you of the planets. Find me one real image of Jupiter or Saturn or Mars from NASA. Look at them. Those are not photographs. There's no photographs. NASA doesn't do photographs. NASA does Photoshop. There's no telescopes flying around out there taking pictures of shit. It's just a bunch of Freemasons with Photoshop. Look, look at their rocket launches. The rockets don't even go straight up. They just come right back down. Most of them just explode. You know how many of their rocket launches fail? They, just, they have no idea what they're doing. They want you to think that they went to the moon and back over and over again. 45 years ago, and then never go back again. That makes a lot of sense. Look at all those pictures again. It's fake. It's so fake. Just admit it to yourself.